good golly, I love me some video game accessories. Also, food. So I'm excited to tell y'all that this episode of My Life in Gaming is sponsored by a service that I have actually been a loyal paying customer to for over a year now. Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code MLIG50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. These are fresh, never frozen, ready to microwave meals of your choosing or chef's choice if you're feeling adventurous. Either way, it's even quicker and a heck of a lot more satisfying than frozen meals from the grocery store. And it has you eating more like you ought to compared to fast food. So yeah, head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code MLIG50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. We've looked at a lot of accessories over the 10 years that we've been producing My Life in Gaming. Some of these are old favorites that we've sworn by since well before launching the channel, while others are much newer. Some are first party products, but others come from smaller companies and community engineers. Sometimes after we've bought something or tested a review sample for the show, even if it is really well made, we find ourselves not actually using it as much as we thought we might. So we thought it might be useful to step back and assess which accessories we actually still find ourselves continuing to use regularly for 80s consoles on up to the current gen and Steam Deck. Back in the day, I barely gave a second thought to veer accessories for my game consoles. Outside of a second controller, everything I thought I'd ever need to play the games was included in the box. Taking that approach meant that I missed out on a whole lot of really cool products. But things are even more interesting today, thanks in part to those who still carry the torch for classic gaming hardware. When you mix in the advancement of tech with the desire to bring modern conveniences to older hardware, it seems like someone in the community is announcing a cool new accessory just about every single week. In this episode, we're gonna be focusing on products that don't require any real technical know-how or modification to your original hardware. So let's get started with one of my favorite subjects to talk about, save file preservation. Over the years, I've covered a slew of different options and methods for backing up save files across various platforms. In 2023, the Memcard Pros from 8-Bit Mods have become an essential part of my gaming setup because they work seamlessly enough that you'd forget that you even have one. Currently, there's two versions available, the Memcard Pro for the PlayStation 1 and the Memcard Pro GC for the GameCube. The Memcard Pro 2 for the PlayStation 2 was recently announced and is available for pre-order. Not only do they give you what amounts to essentially limitless amounts of space for your save files, but they also make it extremely easy to back up those save files to your computer and port them between platforms. Now that they've been around for a bit, they've just been getting better and better. Newer firmware updates have expanded the web interface as well as offering direct FTP access for uploading and downloading save files. In the case of the Memcard Pro for the PlayStation 1 in particular, the tech has matured enough that they've been able to refine the hardware enough to bring down the price to around 30 bucks, making it one of the absolute best deals around if you still use your PS1 regularly. And hey, it'll even work with PS1 games on a PS2. For years, I had to juggle a bunch of PS2 memory cards. Although in 2022, I did find a decent stopgap with a 32 megabit memory card from Katana. Using a giant button on the card itself, you can toggle between four different 8 meg banks which is a whole heck of a lot easier than swapping through a bunch of different memory cards. While it's not a first party device, it uses Magic Gate technology and is officially licensed, which I think makes it a whole lot more reliable than your typical large capacity memory card. Sure, the Memcard Pro 2 will make it obsolete, but my only regret with this card is that I didn't know it existed sooner. 
When it comes to cartridge save files, I used to back these up using a retro cart dumper. Over the years, these have become harder and harder to find, which would be a bummer if it wasn't for the open source cart reader developed by Sony. This device will allow you to dump the ROMs from a cartridge as well as dump and restore save files stored within. SRAM, EEPROM, Flash, you name it, it's good to go. Just plug a cart into the appropriate slot and use the built-in screen, dial, and buttons to navigate. One of my favorite aspects of the open source cart reader is that it's fully self-contained. Save files are backed up and restored directly to the SD card slot. Being open source, this cart reader does seem a bit DIY. In fact, I have one that was built for me by a fan of the show, but you can purchase one pre-made from Japan-based Save the Hero Builders that is ready to go. Sure, it is not cheap to go this route, but if you care about this stuff a lot like I do, then your investment will be rewarded. All right then, let's switch gears and focus on something more cosmetic. I will be the first to admit that I prefer my game consoles to look stock whenever possible. There's obviously some outliers, such as this amazing Ultra 64 logo jewel that I put on my N64 digital console, or these tasteful controller overlays from Graphics Gear. And how about these amazing transparent console shells from Retro Game Restore? That's about the extent of what I do though. For the most part, I stay away from this kind of stuff. Recently, I turned a corner for skins on portable consoles though, thanks to the Project Kill Switch Triple Black Steam Deck skin from dbrand that was sent to me by my friend Colton from Consoloscopy. <laughs> that channel name still makes me laugh every time. I mean, it's not like my palms are sweating all over this thing, but it makes the deck feel so much more robust than it does at a base level. The only real downfall is that I need to use a little USB-C extension to hook it up to the dock because it won't fit otherwise. He also sent me these portal themed thumbstick covers. Now these were a welcome surprise because I recently got into rubber covers for the Switch analog sticks to prevent wear and tear on a Switch light system. I later bought these Skull & Co thumbstick covers for use on my Switch OLED and I think that they're just perfect. Yeah, I know these covers do nothing for stick drift and the like, but I tend to want to prevent rubber coating on the sticks from wearing off over time. From Retroflag, and sent over by Acnes Game Room, is the handheld controller for the Nintendo Switch. Obviously, this takes a lot of inspiration from the GameCube controller, what with its yellow nub right stick, red and green A and B buttons, and the pattern on the right stick. These hall sensing sticks are a bit more robust though and will prevent drifting over time. Sure, it makes the switch a little bit bigger overall, but I do find myself using this a lot more than expected. Acnes Game Room also sent over this silly yet cute Famicom style Joy-Con charging dock that I use all the time. Anyway, if you prefer to use your original Joy-Cons with a grip, then you could do a lot worse than the Zen Grip Pro from Satisfy. This makes longer play sessions easier on your hands, but I don't know, I'd probably use it more if I could dock the system without taking it out of the grip. Remember the flip grip for the Switch? That was a mainstay for vertically oriented shooters on the system, at least for me. It's a real shame that it doesn't work with OLED systems. Instead, the 3D printed Rotate from Retrofrog is a nice little replacement. Although, it's not portable at all. The lithium battery pack for the Sega Nomad from Laser Bear Industries is a great option for powering systems that are missing the clip-on battery pack. Why sacrifice six double A's to get your portable Sega Genesis fix, right? So that right there is about as far as I go with customizing my portable consoles. Well, actually, that's not entirely true because affixing a tempered glass screen protector is top priority for any device with a screen. Although it seems like no matter how many times I've done it, it never gets easier or less stressful. And on that note, let's check in with Try and see what he has to say about console storage and controllers. I do not like running up against storage limits on modern consoles. Throughout the PS4 and Xbox One generation, I always had enough external storage connected to keep 
everything installed. But does connecting a standard mechanical USB drive to a PS4 or Xbox One really count as an accessory worth talking about, though? Probably not, but when it comes to PlayStation 5 and current-gen Xbox, where the matter of what you plug into them can have quite a tangible impact on speed, I think it's worth mentioning what we've got. First of all, for last-gen stuff or other backwards-compatible games, I've used a Samsung 870 QVO SSD with a Sabrent SATA to USB adapter, one each for PS5 and Xbox Series X. I can't take credit for my choices here, though, as they're the exact items tested in Digital Foundry's videos on external storage for both consoles, and their conclusion was that this type of setup was the best bang for the buck, with much reduced load times and transfer speeds compared to the same games on PS4 and Xbox One hardware, even if you were using SSDs with those slower consoles. If it's good enough for Richard Ledbetter, it's good enough for me, so I considered further research unnecessary. Expanding storage for native PS5 and Series X games is a much pricier endeavor due to the ultra-fast storage needed and Microsoft's proprietary cards. For PS5, I eventually treated myself to a splurge on the Western Digital Black SN850X with a whopping 4 terabytes of storage along with a Sabret branded heatsink that is actually designed specifically for PS5 and entirely takes the place of its original storage expansion cover. I'm not even going to bother looking up the surely terrifying price of an 8TB NVMe drive, which the PS5 was just updated to support. Maybe something like that could be affordable by the end of the generation, if we're lucky. I have to admit that I kinda smile whenever I look at Microsoft's proprietary storage expansion cards because, I mean, they really do feel like a modern version of classic memory cards. That said, these don't make me smile so much when I actually spend money on them because, going by current pricing, the largest Microsoft expansion card, 2TB, is barely any cheaper than the 4TB drive I put in my PS5. Now that Western Digital is also making Xbox memory cards, maybe the prices will go down over time, but who knows. A good example of accessories that I thought I would be really into but just never use are the Retro Fighters N64 and Dreamcast controllers. Of course, I love the official N64 controller, so that makes sense that I'd not be keen on an alternative, but even though I have no special love of the Dreamcast controller, I don't know, it's not that the Retro Fighters controller is bad, but I just crave that authentic experience in this case. MLIG subscriber Proto Janus hooked us up with a selection of Hori's well-loved two-pronged N64 controllers but he sent another that has actually become my go-to controller for the system, the ASCII pad, which I didn't even know about and I think was exclusive to Japan. Like the famous SNES ASCII pad, it seems to be made with official OEM parts. I mean, it really does feel like a Nintendo controller, but with ASCII's turbo toggle switches. Hori, of course, also has a history of making really first-party-like officially licensed controllers, my favorite of which is the digital controller for GameCube. This isn't just the best choice for Game Boy games on GameCube, and it's also great for games with mostly digital controls like Resident Evil or Beautiful Joe. Since I've had this one since back in the day, I've never gotten around to seeing if any of the more affordable replicas that have been popping up in recent years are any good. I've also brought up Hori's similarly designed PC Commander for PC Engine before, and yeah, it's still my go-to PC Engine controller. Not really because of the extra buttons, but just because I've never really loved the official PCE D-pad. We're not going to spend much time on the standard first-party controllers for any systems in this episode since they're, you know, the standard. Although there are some variants that deserve a shout-out, like the transforming D-pad Xbox 360 controller. It's not perfect, but it is an improvement. On the more modern side, I do use the Switch Pro Controller a whole heck of a lot. I've never had any stick drift issues. 
Everything from the general feel to the gyro controls to the instant response digital triggers, mm, love it. But yeah, that D-pad, pretty bad, right? But in spite of that, whenever I see a classic games collection or a retro style indie game, I tend to buy it on Switch unless there's like a big advantage to the PS5 version or whatever. Part of that is just because I associate older styles of games with Nintendo, but really the biggest thing that calls me to choose a game for Switch these days is the selection of Nintendo Switch online controllers I can use. In 2021, we covered a ton of games that you can use with these official classic controllers available for purchase to Switch Online subscribers, and I'm still regularly choosing to use these controllers to this day. Most recently, I played Vengeful Guardian Moon Rider with the three-button Genesis controller because I really get a lot of joy out of using the most simple controller possible for any given game. Typically though, the SNES controller is my go-to since it's the most broadly useful due to its button layout and I find myself using it extremely often. In fact, the Switch Online SNES controller is also my go-to Mr. Controller. I understand that it may have a touch more lag compared to other options, although I always use it wired with Mr. and it's not given me any difficulty. I like to put menu on ZL and other functions like inserting coins or flipping Famicom Disk System games to ZR. Admittedly, the N64 controller and NES Joy-Cons get much less use because fewer Switch games can really use them, but I do love it when they work. Another Switch accessory that I don't use as much, but I do use every time I choose to use Joy-Cons instead of the Pro Controller or a Switch Online controller are the Joy-Con AA battery packs. I almost never actually put batteries in these though. I bought them mainly for the added thickness they provide to the separate Joy-Cons, which is the configuration I prefer in some games like Super Mario Odyssey. I do indeed still use most of the controller charging docks that were featured in the dock stands and chargers episode I made back in 2018. The newest addition to the lineup is a first party PS5 controller charger, although I have three PS5 controllers, so I kind of use them on a rotation. I also really like this Power A Switch Pro Controller dock that can accommodate the length of NES Joy-Cons and I am still using those magnetic charging cords, particularly with 8-bit dough controllers. For some reason, the ones I have seem to not actually charge Switch Online controllers, so I just use standard USB-C cables for those run from an Anchor USB hub. Speaking of 8-bit dough or 8-bit do controllers, I've acquired quite a few of them over the years, and to be honest, most of them sit unused these days. I basically don't use the Bluetooth ones at all anymore, with the exception of the venerable M30, but I only ever use it in wired mode, primarily with the Mister. The 2.4G models of 8-bit dough controllers are the ones I mostly use today, and they are much more appealing to use wirelessly, not just because of lower input latency compared to Bluetooth, but also because they are just instantly connected once turned on, like the wave birds of old. The one I use the most is the SN30 because it's a great partner for the GBA consoleizer and its SNES controller port. I still have the Bluetooth receivers for NES and SNES, but they're just stowed away. The 2.4G experience is just so much better, and the controllers themselves were improved compared to earlier Bluetooth versions, as the D-pads on both the N30 and SN30 2.4G models handle the contra diagonals test maybe not as perfectly as original controllers, but they're pretty close. Corey, however, has had a lot of success with a different line of Bluetooth receivers that he'll be talking about shortly. That's about the extent of my 8-bit do, 8-bit do controller usage these days. I recently got their officially licensed Neo Geo CD style controller, and it feels really great to hold, but the micro switchy clicky D-pad thing is... Certainly not what I'm used to, so I'm not sure yet how much of a mainstay it might become for me. I think Corey has continued to use a wider array of 8-bit dough controllers than I have though, particularly for Switch. I've never really been able to feel satisfied with alternatives to the Pro Controller, but he tends to be a really big fan.
Due to how my consoles are set up, wireless controllers are 100% the most convenient way to play games. Yeah, I can go wired if need be, but 9 times out of 10, I'm going to go for the pick up and play factor of a wireless pad. And through trial and error, I figured out a solution for just about every single console I have hooked up. Try mentioned the 8-bit dough pads, and yeah, I love them for the most part. Although these days, I find myself preferring Crix's Joy's controllers for the Genesis more and more. It just feels closer to the real thing. I also have 8-bit Doze Pro controllers paired with the Mr. and Analog Pocket via Bluetooth. A Pro Plus controller is paired with one of 8-bit Doze USB receivers in the Evercade VS. The cool thing about the 8-bit Doze Ultimate controller is that it can switch between Bluetooth and it has a separate 2.4G USB receiver. So I can end up using it on a Nintendo Switch or Steam Deck. But the problem with using 8-bit Doze controllers with a retro system is that they're all at the mercy of controller-specific 2.4G receivers or if a console has Bluetooth built in. So what if I want to use, say, an M30 on a Sega Saturn? I mean, those new Japanese-style M30 pads are basically begging to be used on one, right? Here is where Darth Cloud's Blue Retro comes in. Blue Retro is an open source, ultra low lag Bluetooth protocol that is compatible with a whole load of different consoles and controllers. When they say low lag, they mean it. Latency is comparable to 2.4G and is primarily limited by how capable the controller itself is. The biggest challenge is that the hardware needs to be adapted for each system. Previously, this was handled by a number of console-specific dongles that would plug into the main Blue Retro receiver. It's robust, but I could see it being messy. Thankfully, a number of more compact, console-specific receivers have been or are being developed. My first foray into the world of Blue Retro was thanks to RetroTime, who developed a Nintendo 64-specific version. Once the Nintendo Switch Online N64 controller came out, I knew what I wanted and what I had to do. And, yep, it works great. It connects quickly and feels authentic. It even has four memory card banks built in that you can swap between using a web interface. Once I understood how capable Blue Retro receivers were, I was on the hunt for more. I found just about everything I wanted from Humble Bazooka, one of the most prolific Blue Retro developers around. I quickly picked up his 3DO adapter so that I could use my black Bluetooth M30 with it because that's close enough to the original pad, except a lot better. And with the announcement of 8-Bit Doe's Neo Geo CD controller, the Neo Geo receiver lets me use it on original hardware. Wow. Humble Bazooka has most recently released an adapter for the Sega Saturn that is just amazing. While his previous adapters had a nice looking 3D printed shell to it, the Saturn version is on a whole other level because it has a plastic molded shell. Finally, there it is, the M30 on the Saturn, something I've been wanting for several years now. You can configure each receiver by connecting to it via Bluetooth with your computer and using a web interface. Firmware updates are also handled this way, but I will admit that it's not the most refined process. It seems to take a really long time to update. Hopefully, this will be improved upon in the future. So while I've been moving over to Blue Retro receivers for a lot of stuff, they don't cover all the bases. So here's some of the other wireless solutions that I'm using as well. 8BitDo released a great TurboGrafx-16 slash PC Engine controller that I wanted to use in my Super Graphics, but it comes with a USB dongle and is 2.4G wireless only. So was I out of luck? Not if you have one of Robert Dale Smith's USB to PCE adapters. Before Blue Retro, I was actually using Robert's SNES to 3DO dongle that lets you use SNES controllers with the 3DO. Similarly, I was using an SNES to Neo adapter from RetroFrog so I could use SNES controllers with my Neo Geo. Since moving to Blue Retro on that, I'm now using it with my Haas Super Gun where it is just as useful. Brook is a familiar name in the retro gaming accessory scene. They've been making wireless controller adapters for a long time now and I use several of their Wingman controller adapters for various systems. The Wingman PS2 works with the PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2. I sync DualShock 3 pads to these for a more authentic experience. 
although they do tend to have the highest amount of lag. However, they are the only adapters that support pressure-sensitive buttons on the PS2. 8BitDo's recently released receiver for the PlayStation 1 and 2 supports neither the DualShock 3 or pressure sensitivity. That's a bummer. The Wingman SD lets me use an Xbox One controller with the Dreamcast. It also has a built-in VMU memory unit in the receiver. Finally, the Wingman XB2 lets me use Xbox One and Xbox Series controllers on an original Xbox, although you will need a controller port to USB-A cable for it. On the subject of the Xbox Series controller, I found myself running into a lot of limitations with trying to pair it with a number of wireless receivers because it uses a newer version of Bluetooth that isn't compatible with older receivers. I mean, I think that's the whole reason the Wingman XB2 had to be made. Retroflag has figured out a workaround with the Super Pack for Xbox Series controllers. I had no idea this was even a thing till one showed up in my P.O. box from Acnes Game Room. Plugging this into the battery compartment turns your controller into a makeshift elite controller by enabling a bunch of features like being able to be paired with normally incompatible consoles and receivers, motion controls on switch systems, and button combo macros that can be tied to these small, out-of-the-way paddles. Oh, and it also has a rechargeable battery on board. You know, if you have absolutely zero interest in going wireless, then I can always recommend a controller extension. These are available from various places online, although I've noticed that newer ones seem to be of significantly lesser quality than the older ones. Maybe it's just me, though. Still, if you're at a used game shop, ask to see if you can look through some of their assorted cable bins. It's not always fun or even clean, but you might be amazed at what you find in there. Maybe you'll find some official cable extensions in there. All right, on that note, Let's get back to try for some more cable talk. Love them or hate them, switchers and cables are the heart and veins of any gaming setup that has more than a couple of consoles hooked up, especially when it comes to the complexities of dealing with analog video. But the great thing about some switchers is that you don't really even have to think about them anymore once you've got them hooked up with good cables. For me, coaxial shielded RGB SCART cables routed through two daisy chain G SCART switchers along with component cables going into one G comp switcher have remained at the core of my analog console usage. I've had the ones I've got for a long time, but the place to buy G SCART and G comp today is Rondo Products, which is the same company as Castlemania Games. Since these switchers have two outputs, I send one to the RetroTINK 5X for digitization and upscaling, which is ultimately what I capture for recordings and streams, while the other output goes to my 20L5 PVM. Right now, I'm using the RetroTINK 4K prototype that I've been testing with my HDMI consoles in a separate room. So for now, I'm happy with the results I get with the RetroTINK 5X in this setup. When I first moved my analog video consoles into this room, it was initially a lot more complex and also involved a few Extron switchers. As you may know, these are very high quality professional switchers that are readily available on eBay. And while the prices probably aren't quite as low as they were a few years ago, they can still be great switchers to buy if other options aren't available or if the price is right. It's just that the way I was trying to use them was simply overcomplicating things. So at the moment, none of my Extron switchers are connected, but Corey will be showing you how he uses some in his soon forthcoming updated room tour video. Something I use a lot when I need to connect stuff for a temporary use case are male-to-male -male and male-to-female HD Retrovision component cables. They're just straight up RCA cables. I've used some pretty poor component cables that looked deceptively beefy, so now I just use these whenever possible because I know I can trust them when making video quality comparisons and such. While I don't use the Genesis or SNES HD Retrovision cables in my main setup, Corey has several systems hooked up with them. For me, they're more like for quick and easy temporary connections or a cable I can grab if I need to take a system on the road, so I like to keep them accessible rather than permanently installed. 
I do, however, use the PS2 and Wii HD retrovision cables in my main setup, which, like the male-to-male -male and male-to-female component cables, don't contain any conversion circuitry. They're just really high-quality cables for those systems. I know that this is probably one of the closer looks you've had at my newer analog video setup thus far, so you might have some questions, but this isn't a room tour video and I gotta save some stuff for my own updated setup video too, you know. I created this setup to make things a bit less overly complicated in the living room, so now I only use HDMI consoles in there. But that does include several classic consoles with HDMI mods. Those don't fit the subject of this episode, of course, but one classic console doesn't need a mod at all for HDMI output. The venerable Carby from Insurrection Industries is still my GameCube HDMI workhorse. I've never particularly minded how 480p from this looks on my OLED by itself, but hoo hoo boy! Now that I've gotten a taste of what the RetroTink 4K can do with a digital 480p signal, it would be hard to go back. There are a lot more GameCube HDMI adapters out there these days, and while I can't speak to their physical quality, they're all based on the open source GC video project, so they should in theory work the same. But you should try to avoid buying these from companies that have a history of cloning closed source devices. I do want to quickly acknowledge two other HDMI devices that aren't exactly designed for games, but we both use for very specific gaming needs. First, a mono price HDMI audio inserter, which neither of us actually uses to insert audio, but rather to fix compatibility issues with audio signals from certain HDMI mods. If you get scratchy audio or no audio from like a GBA consoleizer or PS1 Digital, see if a device like this might fix it. This one adds no lag and doesn't affect the picture. And secondly, the current HDMI splitters that we're using to strip HDCP out of the PlayStation 3 and PS TV are from Avidio, and you can still buy these today. Personally, I just keep things simple by connecting one to each. I do sometimes worry about cheap HDMI devices like these though, because our buddy John Lineman had an aging HDCP stripper kill the HDMI output on a PS3 and fry an entire AV receiver. But what are you gonna do? Not gonna capture HDMI from PS3 or PS TV without something like a HDCP stripping splitter. And it's not like there's some brand name company intentionally putting HDCP strippers out there. So I guess we'll just keep our eye out for new good options and keep using the ones we've got for now and hope for the best. Been good so far. Let's look at some stuff that you stick in cartridge slots. What more is there to say about EverDrives? Crix's products are the standard in flash carts by this point. Even though Cory has been the driving force behind most of our flash cart episodes, I can't deny just how useful they are. Most of the ones I have are actually hand-me-downs from Cory, but even these older models, most of which are no newer than like 2016, serve my needs extremely well. Obviously, you should look at the comparison charts on Crix's website and stuff, but my point is, a lot of people may not necessarily even need to upgrade or get the most high-end model to begin with. Funny enough, my Super UFO Pro 8 flash carton dumper, which became hard to find for a good price after I did an episode on it, ended up falling into disuse. I just didn't find myself playing patched games on it over the years as much as I thought I might. A different sort of flash device is the extremely affordable FDS stick by Loopy, the creator of some of the DS and 3DS capture kits that are out there. It plugs into the RAM adapter of a Famicom disk system, meaning you don't even need the data reading module, the main red box, or a power supply. It's also a great way to test FDS stuff on FPGA consoles and such without needing to move the entire system. Whenever I play Master System games, I almost always reach for the Powerbase Mini FM, originally designed by DB Electronics, which lets me play Master System games on the Sega Genesis. 
The older one I have here is from Stone Age Gamer, but today it's mostly sold by Rondo products. This integrates a real YM2413 FM synthesizer so that FM synth soundtracks can be used totally authentically. Another lock-on cartridge that's an oldie but goodie is the Super Game Boy, particularly the speed accurate Super Game Boy 2. This remains one of my top favorite official game accessories of all time, especially since it's the only official way to utilize the awesome, awesome, awesome Super Game Boy color palettes. It frustrates me to no end that Nintendo continues to ignore this part of Game Boy history, as the Switch Online Game Boy app lacks support for Super Game Boy enhancements, despite the Super Game Boy enhanced logo being visible on boxes in the game selection. Come on. One pair of accessories I've been using since at least 2016 and kinda hate, but keep using because I don't really have much of an alternative to, is the GameCube Action Replay and SD Media Launcher. For me at least, this remains the easiest way to launch homebrew on an unmodified GameCube, as the Action Replay boots the GameCube into a mode where it can read files off an SD card in a memory card slot. I use this to launch Swiss so that I can force 480p in games that don't natively support it, as well as for launching the Game Boy interface. Otherwise, I don't do anything else with it, so it's really just the disk swapping that annoys me. Unfortunately, it seems that you're not likely to come across an NTSC action replay anymore, but there are also methods for launching homebrew that involved hacked memory card saves for certain games. You can, of course, also modify GameCube to bypass the need for any of this, but since I mostly play on unmodified GameCubes, this is still what I do. And lastly, The Time Sleuth by Dan Koontz is an open source lag tester. It can be programmed to output five different resolutions over HDMI selectable with a dial. If it wasn't for this thing, I'd have probably not discovered some of the niche flaws that made me decide to exchange the LG C2 OLED for the previous year's C1 model, which suits my needs much better. You know, you might be surprised just how often you'll use a device like this when you have it available to you. Currently, it looks like Time Sleuths are being sold by Rondo Products in North America and Video Game Perfection in Europe. I know that there's a lot to consider in this video, but I'm curious if you found anything here that might be useful in your setup or with your game collection. With the way things are going in the retro gaming scene these days, it's thriving. And I said it before, and I'm gonna say it again. It seems like new accessories get announced every single week. So who knows when the next essential piece of gear will show up? Or who knows, maybe it's already out there and we just don't know about it yet. In that case, We'd love to hear about all sorts of stuff that you use in your setup. So hit us with it.